Hey guys, I'm Big Mike and like always, I'd like to thank you for joining today. Today we have a webinar from Mike Bellafuri. He has authored two very popular trading books. One is called One Good Trade and his newest is The Playbook. We're actually going to give away 10, 10 autographed copies of The Playbook at the end of the webinar today. So pay close attention to the uh, topics covered by Mike as the questions to win copies of those books will be based on the content covered today. Uh, before I turn things over to Mike, I want to remind everybody the webinar is being recorded and I'll post a recording on the YouTube channel tomorrow. I'll also give it to Mike so he can post it out to his followers. Uh, Mike has said that he wants to take questions as they come, so try to keep the questions relevant to what is being discussed and you can type those directly into the questions box and then I'll ask those questions to Mike and we'll try to get them answered. All right, guys, give me one second. I'm going to turn things over to Mike. All right, Mike, you have control. Okay, thanks, Big Mike. Can you guys see my screen? We've got it. Okay, great. So I'm in a little bit of trouble. Before I even start this, I made a mistake that perhaps lots of you have made in the past, which is today is my anniversary. And uh, so uh, I had to send some flowers over to my wife and explain to her why I wouldn't actually be taking her out to dinner tonight. <laughs> so uh -oh. since I'm getting in a lot of trouble for that, we better really make this a really awesome session. So bring those questions and let's have some fun, okay? So first I want to congratulate everybody who's joining us today. I get tons of people who come up to me, who interview with us, tons of people who send me emails, tons of people who reach out to me through social media like Twitter and StockTwits and say, hey, I really want to become a great trader. And I think that they think that they mean it. The issue I have with all of that, in fact, uh, one of my partners uh, from Texas shot me an email about him receiving a personal letter from a guy who really wants to be a successful trader according to his handwritten note. And look, we always love those things. Those things do work a little bit. But if you actually want to become a consistently profitable trader, you got to do the things that you guys are doing right now. You got to do the things that you've taken the next 90 minutes to do. And that's to work on your game. And so you right now, you're doing the things that we certainly respect. And there's nothing that we respect more at SMB than people who are trying to make themselves better, people who are working on their trading game. So well done. For those of you who don't know me, and I suspect that there are probably a lot of people out there that are part of Big Mike's community and don't know who I am, so I want to take a little bit of time and tell you just a little bit about myself and a little bit about our firm, and we'll get into the presentation about the future of trading. So. Uh, I wrote a book three or four years ago. Uh, the title of the book was One Good Trade. Uh, humbly, it was, it's, it's been called a trading classic. It was the, um, the best-selling trading book in 2010 uh, for the first year that it came out. Uh, my next book, was, which I just wrote, is called The Playbook. Um, it's very well received. Um, hearing lots of good, getting a lot of good feedback about that. Goals for this presentation today, and, and I should say also, um, I'm a co-founder of SME Capital, which is a proprietary trading desk in New York City. Um, the proprietary trading desk is a desk where we back, we fully back all our traders. Uh, we're not an arcade. We don't take people's money. Um, we, we have trained a lot of traders from scratch. Um, we take risk. That's, our, that's the business we want to be in. We want to back traders. We want to back discretionary traders uh, with firm capital and take on all the risk. We want to back quantitative models. 
uh, with firm capital and take on all the risk. So our goals today, I'm going to share my experience co-founding a prop firm. It has not been a straight line upwards by any means, and I want to be forthright about that. And I bet you there's a lot of people out there whose trading career has not been a straight line upwards. And certainly uh, mine as a trader hasn't been, and, and running this firm hasn't been as well. And I think there's probably lessons that you all can learn from my experience is good and bad. I want to share how our prop firm has had to adapt and why. I want to share how discretionary traders are modeling without the necessity to code. I want to highlight our vision for the future of trading. And certainly, if you take away one thing from this presentation, it is what I think is the biggest lesson that I've learned from the market, and perhaps you'll learn from the market as well, which is, and this is how my book, The Playbook, ends. It ends with this quote, which is, you can be better tomorrow than you are today. So a little bit about SMB. We build CPTs. What are CPTs? Certified Lots of professional answers. traders. Judy says, uh, Judy says, consistently profitable traders. Uh, David says, carriage paid. I don't know what that means. I don't know, David, what that means. Uh, lots of consistently profitable traders. So, yeah, so CBTs means consistently profitable traders, and that's the way that we judge uh, guys who are good. I mean, you can make $50,000 in one month and lose $75,000 in the next month. And if you only talked about how you made $50,000, uh, you'd be leaving out a big part of your trading. And so that's what we're trying to do with the guys on our desk is, is get them, we trade a lot of guys from scratch, uh, up to consistently profitable traders, meaning they've never traded before um, or they've traded very little. And we teach them, they go through our training, uh, we provide all of the technology. We have incredible proprietary technology that we offer our guys. This is technology that's not available uh, unless you trade inside of our prop firm. You can't just go to a uh, broker dealer and, and use our trading technology. It's, it's, it's only for us. Um, it has just amazing abilities to uh, allow traders to find more of the setups that make the most sense to them. It's a, it's a p and driver. And we certainly offer our guys big books, lots of downside. That's the way a prop firm ought to be. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to be, be the people who perhaps have a little bit more money than you do individually. We're going to be the people who have perhaps the ability to draw down more than you can. Um, we're going to be giving you proprietary technology. We're going to be arming you with the education for you to trade different types of products. Uh, whether that's equities, whether or not that's options, whether or not that's uh, forex, whether or not that's futures, whether that whether or not that's learning how to uh, build automated strategies, it's our job to provide an infrastructure uh, for traders to make more P&L. So that's what we do. We're prop desk backing discretionary traders, backing algorithmic trading models, uh, training and backing new traders, and teaching new traders globally. So our philosophy, I think there's two things to point out about our philosophy as we start. I think there's two things that we do which are unique than lots of other uh, firms and perhaps lots of other traders, which is one, we focus on what we say are the stocks that are in play. Those are stocks that have fresh news. Cheat sheet for that is anything up or down 3% with increasing volume in the pre-market, those are the stocks we're looking at. And secondly, we utilize the principles of elite performance with our trading. We think of our traders as elite performers. We think that if you want to find out how good you can be as a trader, and that's our slogan for our education arm, how good you can be. And I'll just take a step back. 
we have three entities at SMB. We have a prop firm, we have an education arm, and we have SMB Systems, which, are, which is our algorithmic trading company. We think that if you want to become as good as you can be as a trader, that you've got to tap into these principles of elite performance. You're a trading athlete. We teach our guys to get better every day. We don't talk a lot about P&L. If a guy's doing well, we're very careful with our language. You know, for instance, you know, one of our guys had a, had a pretty good month, put up over $60,000, um, the best he's done in a long time. And we want to use language that is careful. We don't want to highlight the P&L. We want to highlight the things that went into him actually achieving that P&L. We talk about trading big in our A-plus setups in the playbook. I talked about how each trader should build a playbook and then from that playbook ferret out their best setups. We call them A-plus setups. And in SMBU we talk about not money, not P&L, not fancy cars and cool clothes. And We talk about how good, can, how good can you be. That's our challenge to anyone who goes through our education. So SMB begins, and I want to I want to give a little bit of a backdrop of our beginning because it dovetails into some challenges that we faced, and I want to talk about that because I think it's important. So SMB began with one really bad idea, and it was mine, and I had this idea that I could just start a prop firm, and I did so from my apartment. We were certainly underfunded to start. I had traded my own account for many, many years, and I decided that just trading wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. I wanted to do something more. And I got this crazy idea that I would start a firm that uh, taught people how to navigate this new and challenging market than when I had begun. And I looked around and I saw a bunch of arcades sprouting up, essentially asking people for money and really not offering much and overcharging on commissions and pretending they were teaching people. And I, I kind of felt like there was a, a really big opportunity for us to create a business off of teaching and, and, and backing the right guys and, and, and getting them to be pretty good. At Singapore, I, I did a presentation recently in Singapore we have a partnership with the biggest uh, Singapore uh, brokerage house there teaching their clients how to trade U.S. equities. And I said that starting SMB was the most delusional, naive, arrogant thing I've ever done. If I knew better, I probably would not have started SMB, but I did. And so I asked my best friend at the time, Steve Spencer, a trader, if he would join me in this effort to start a new firm. And his response was, and I remember this to this day, I remember how dismissive he was. I remember how automatic his response was. Remember, he had been a trader himself for, at that time, almost 10 years, and he had traded his own money, had all the freedom in the world, was doing really well. And he said, why would I want to do that? I couldn't even actually convince my best friend, my best friend since we were five years old, Steve taught me actually how to play tic-tac-toe at camp, I couldn't even convince him to help me start this firm. So I just started and we started by providing a solution, there was a demand for people to be trained, there was insufficient trader training abound. We had a willingness to teach and develop traders. And it turned out we were actually quite good at it. We had a little bit of branding luck. We were, I wrote One Good Trade. We were on the show Wall Street Warriors, which is a funny story. I'm sure some of you know of me from Wall Street Warriors and SMB from Wall Street Warriors. How many people have seen Wall Street Warriors? So a couple of you guys. So the thing about Wall Street Warriors was at the time there was very little high definition programming. 
and everyone was buying high definition televisions. And there was this company called the Mojo Channel, which was one of the first channels that was offering high definition content. And they didn't have a lot of it. And one of the contents, one of the pieces of content they had was this show called Wall Street Warriors. And I swear, every time I came home and turned on my high definition TV, I saw myself on TV, which was great for our firm, but it kind of creeped me out a little bit. We, we touch over 100 countries each day through SMBU blog. We certainly didn't at the beginning, but we just started sharing a whole bunch of stuff. I was writing multiple times each day, and it resonated with the trading community about you know, how here are these pro traders just sharing stuff and talking about uh, not only good trades, but often the things we were doing wrong and the things we needed to do better. And we, uh, we've been a partner with StockTwits for a long time since the beginning. Certainly StockTwits TV was something that we did with them uh, at the early onset of StockTwits. I mean, StockTwits is like family to us. The co-founders actually were invited to my, to my wedding. Um, I was just out in, at Stucktoberfest with Howard Lindzen and all the guys out there. So we had a little bit of luck. We built our desk from four guys. I, it was uh, me, Steve, one of my buddies, and this guy Mervin, who, and I think a lot of you can relate to this, Mervin was the greatest demo trader that I've ever trained. He crushed it on the demo. And then, Mysteriously, when he traded live, he lost money every single day he traded live. He was both the greatest demo trader in the history of the U.S. equity markets and the very worst live trader in the history of the U.S. trading markets. So we were essentially doing the work that others didn't want to do in terms of training people we did really well for multiple, multiple years. We developed a strong reputation in new trader training. Um, you know, it's hard to train traders from scratch. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. There's a tremendous amount of content that needs to be built. There's review sessions every day that must be kept. There's mentoring that must be done. There's babysitting that must be done. You got to talk to guys about the girlfriends they just broke up with. Sometimes you got to put a couple extra bucks in their pocket when you really didn't have to, but they need it. There's a lot that goes into it. It's a hard job. And so as we sort of built up this firm from zero to 60, we spun off our education. That's how we built our firm. We started as a prop desk. We built it from zero to 60 traders. And then Steve, my partner, had this idea, hey, why don't we take our, our training and spin it off into an educational company? And we did. I actually didn't think that would be a good idea at the time. But it turned out it, it was a good idea. And it turns out there's a tremendous amount of demand, particularly internationally uh, and particularly virtually, for people that are want to learn how to trade U.S. equities. So 60% of our business is done overseas. We're probably asked to visit. We were just asked to go to Nigeria. Uh, we were asked last week to go to Australia. We've been asked multiple times to go to Russia. So there's just a lot of interest outside of the U.S., which I think actually I'll just make a small point about this, people interested in, in markets. As a small business person, there's never been a better time to start a small business. And that's because if you become really good at something, if you become awesome at something, the market is global. You put up a website, you put up a blog, you put your stuff out there to the world. No matter what it is, if you become awesome, you become the best at something, your market is so much greater than it ever was. And to be able to tap into that market is cheaper than it ever was. To build a website, to put video out there is, is much less expensive than it used to be to have you know, a brick and mortar global business. And so anyway, SMBU became a destination to learn how to trade US markets. And we teach people in systems, we teach people in options, we teach people in FX, futures, and certainly equities. So, when we started, now the rough stuff, now the rough stuff starts, now the bumpy ride starts. When we started, our business model, our career path for our guys was, hey, become a consistently profitable active trader and then get bigger. That was our brilliant idea. You learn how to become an intraday equities trader and then get bigger. And that was the beginning and middle of the business path. It was one product, one market. 
I say that's so 2006-ish. It's so wrong for today because the margin of error is too small for that to only be the business path for the active trader. So we built our firm up from scratch to 60, and then we hit a perfect storm. Some of our better traders left. Arcade started figuring out that our guys were doing really well, and they came poaching. And we couldn't offer, as a prop firm in that business model, we couldn't offer what these arcades were willing to offer our traders. There was contraction in prop trading. You know, one of the big firms went from 350 traders down to 30. The government investigated a third-party vendor of ours. And in doing so, they asked us to provide documents about that third-party vendor, which scared the heck out of us. We spent a week interviewing lawyer after lawyer so that there wasn't any chance that the government wouldn't turn and start asking questions about us. And it turned out, while that was an incredibly scary and costly, it was a well into the six-figure spend. While that was scary, uh, it turned out that that third-party vendor was clean, and it sort of ended there. But that was, boy, that the government investigates you on anything, that is scary. I mean, if you've ever gotten a notice from the IRS, I mean, that is, that's a bad day. Just looking at the envelope, that'll ruin your day. Just checking out the envelope. Regulation and fees increased in our space. Essentially, a lot of the traders have to become registered. And HFTs, high frequency trading, came in and started to game out some of the trades that we had made a lot of money in. They started gaming out some of those strategies. So the HFT started gaming out microscalping momentum trading. When I first started SMB, these were the these were two strategies that I really taught our guys. And you know, momentum trading was great for lots of years. I traded. Uh, it was great for when I first started SMB. It still works um, today. It's just you have to be much more selective when you momentum trade just like you have to be much more selective when you micro-scout. But we, we, couldn't just, we couldn't trade the same way that we, we had taught our guys to trade. We had to adapt. So I remember this email. I got this email on a Friday. My BlackBerry buzzes, and essentially it's this in-your-face email from a guy who says, essentially, why do you guys even bother? Computer programs are taking over your space. You guys are dinosaurs. And, you know, it got so bad, I think, that HFTs were being blamed for almost everything. There was a complete over-exaggeration about their impact in trading. They had an impact, and algos definitely hurt. Like, for instance, we, we, we see... Uh, if we go to buy a stock, uh, HFTs immediately step in front of us. If we go to sell a stock, HFTs immediately step in front of us. If there's more slippage in stocks. You might actually have been able to get out for a two cent loss in the past, and sometimes now that's 13 cents. And if you trade as much as I do, and the size that I trade, you know, 5,000 shares at an extra 15 or 10 cents on a losing trade, that starts to add up. So we had to keep adapting. We had to pivot. And there's a great quote from Ray Dalio that means a lot to me. And look, I think that there's probably a lot of people listening to this who have been profitable traders at some point in their trading career and then have underperformed. And I think that there's people listening to this webinar who think that you know guys like me always have the answers and it's always a straight line. And, you know, we live on the Upper West Side, sipping champagne and caviar. Caviar. I don't even know how to pronounce that. So clearly I don't do that. But this is a tough business, and uh, it has not been a straight line upwards. But one of the really great quotes that means a lot to me is a quote from Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater, which is either the first or the second biggest hedge fund in the U.S., and he wrote, weakness doesn't matter if you find a solution. And so we were sitting there 
with some of our guys leaving, some challenges facing us. And I, I would say, and I wrote about this in the playbook in the introduction, that there were personal issues that I had to go through as well. Um, and those personal issues were that um, my dad had a major stroke. I had to go, I went to go help my dad recover from that stroke. I went to go help him with his rehab in Florida. And then 10 days later, my mom passed away. Um, and I wrote about this in the playbook at the beginning of it. And so this perfect storm is hitting. And also personally, I'm not actually in the frame of mind to trade. And I'm not able to be in the office full time uh, because I got to go help my dad. And uh, we moved my dad back to Long Island. He moved in with my sister. Um, and I was helping my dad in Long Island um, rehab there. And so we're, we're trying to pivot and ferret out the stuff that's not working for us uh, while all this is going on. But we adapted. And we adapted and we got stronger, as you will, if you find yourself underperforming after a period of market excellence, you'll become a better trader. There is really always a solution if you take the time to think about it and you're willing to do the work and be patient. And for us, we started to adapt by doing a lot more swing trading, a lot more intraday swing trading and a lot more swing trading. We say they're trades to hold. And we say they're trades to hold until there's a reason to, to sell. We developed a new playbook of these trades to hold, intraday swing, swing trades. They're offering us more upside. We started building some trading models. We encouraged our traders to build auto strategies, the ability to supplement what you're doing, to supplement your discretionary trading with auto strategies. And I think this is what I think this is what more have to do in our game. I think going through this adaptation, going through this period of rebuilding at our firm, going through this pivot, we learned that there were and look, a lot of firms just kind of went under, and a lot of firms. Uh, seriously pull back and you know we had a we had a hit and then we rebuilt and got back to and better and, and got back to and, and are better than where we were and so yeah, here's what I've learned here are the things that I think are important today so I think discretionary traders are completely undervalued it, it seems like anyone will give money to somebody who has an automated strategy but that's true if you know if you're sitting out there and you're looking for a bigger book and you are a experienced discretionary trader I think you're undervalued if if you archive your best setups with detail if you become more bionic and we'll talk about that if you start to auto trade building automated strategies if you become multi product if you become multi market if you are receptive to constant coaching, which we definitely should talk about, and if you are scalable as a trader. If, you're, if your scalability makes sense as it relates to risk. So let's talk about some of these things. So recently, uh, SMB uh, created a JV with another firm. The firm's uh, KTG. It's a, it's a Texas firm. It's been in business a long time. And as part of this JV, we started recruiting some experienced traders in New York City to you know, fill up some of the space we had at our new office. We took the SME legacy traders and, and brought them to this pretty big midtown office that we sit in today, which I'm broadcasting from today on uh, Third Avenue and dead center of Manhattan and you know we, we started to fill up some space and so I, I met with and I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of experienced traders in New York and there became a common theme that resonated as as I interviewed and as our firm interviewed all of these experienced traders and so many of these guys 
have been seven-figure traders in the past. Yeah, maybe some guys are $800,000 producers. Lots of seven-figure guys, guys who had done it for multiple years, looking for a new home, looking for a bigger book, looking for a new book. And, you know, inevitably, we'd start to talk about trade strategy. How do you make money? And what I found was it was very difficult for those experienced traders to articulate how they made money. And when you broke down what they were doing, it became pretty clear that there was an over-reliance on their intuition. And they were suffering from a non-news edge while they actually thought they had a news edge. There was a complete lack of methodology. And so, you know, we talk about this non-news edge a lot on our blog because I actually think that perhaps for some of the people listening, I bet you a couple of you suffer from this. And this is what I think the non-news edge is. You go on Bloomberg, you read a story that Tesla's going to go down. The story makes sense to you. You decide to get short, and you do get short. That's a non-news edge. You go to briefing.com. You click on an article that they've posted. They say a company is probably going to trade higher. It makes sense to you. You get long. It goes down. You, you take a hit. That's a non-news edge. There's lots of people who read something on the internet. They read an article, and the article makes sense to them, and they, after reading that one article, decide in their infinite wisdom that this stock is going to go up or down. That's a non-news edge. There's a firm out there that's uh, run by some former SMB guys, and these guys actually have a news edge. And they spend over $85,000 a month on research. Their guys come in at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they read everything. And then they develop theses about how a stock will trade. And not, not based on what they think the research is going to, not what they think based on reading the research what a stock should do, but based on what they think big institutional traders are going to do after reading the same research. It's not about their opinion, it's about big money it's about big money's opinion. What's big money going to do after they read this research? And then, not only do they do that, not only do they read everything, not only do they think about what the big money is going to be doing, but if something starts to trade against them, if price action starts to work against them, they're out. They're out, their trade's done. That's a news edge. Reading one article on Bloomberg.com, is not a news edge. So I wrote this book, The Playbook, and the biggest takeaway that you ought to have from it, how many people have actually read The Playbook? Okay, great. Looks like uh, at least it looks like quite a bit. Yes, carefully, Judy. I like that. I'm always amazed that people read my book twice. And David, David Pope, I'm I'm on my second reading. That's impressive. I hope the second time is as good as the first. Morgan Jones wants an autographed copy. We'll see, buddy. So, ah, look at Cynthia. Cynthia read OGT, one good trade, three times. That's amazing. That's, that's really good work. Good for you. I hope it helped. So, so, we, uh, so in the playbook, the playbook is about 
coming up with a methodology. That's what the playbook's about. It's about you sitting down, you developing a, play, a methodology for, for you to find setups that are worth your intellectual, financial, and, and, and personal effort. And personalizing them, these setups should be the, the plays that really make the most sense to you. And then coming up with a system to trade them more often, trade them bigger, and tapping into the present age to be bionic. So essentially the playbook argues that after each close you should archive your favorite setup. You should find the setup that made the most sense to you on each trading day and you should archive it in template form. We'll talk about what that template could look like. And from these trades, you should choose your A-plus setups. So you should be building over periods of months a big playbook. It should sit on your desk. It should be big, thick, like you could publish a book. And from that big book, you should go in and you should ferret out the best of the best, the A-plus setups. And on those trades, you've got to increase your risk. How do you do that? For a swing trader, we say 2 to 5% of your book can be risked on your A-plus trades. For an intraday trader, we say 30% of your intraday stop. And from those A-plus trades, you can go even further and create what I say is the all-in trade. This is a trade that Shark and I talk about. Shark is the gentleman standing, talking to some of the boys in the desk. This is a shot from our new Midtown headquarters. Shark's giving a little bit of a talking to to the boys. And there are trades where you can actually risk more than 30% of your intraday stop. You can risk your whole day. You can go all in. Using the poker term, you can go all in. Put all your money on the table. Those have obviously got to be the best of the best A-plus trades. But this process of understanding what you do well and using a template form to archive it is very effective. Here's what the template looks like. So the way that, that we suggest that you build your template is like this. For each trade, let's say you traded uh, racks today and you found that really great short around 45. It's hovering below VWAP. On the tape, it's not really trading above 45. And you get short, and you try and hold the trade down for until it breaks its downtrend. And you want to archive that setup. Or maybe you want to take a look at SRPT today, and you want to archive that setup. Or perhaps you want to archive a swing trade in DDD from 50. Or perhaps you want to archive a short opportunity in Facebook below 5150. Whatever the setup is, whatever makes sense to you, here are the, here's the way that you can communicate to yourself in a way that summarizes those ideas. So each playbook template can have a big picture. You can archive the intraday fundamentals for that trade. You can archive the technical analysis that's pertinent to that trade. There should be a section for reading the tape, a section on intuition, a section on trade management, trade strategy, and trade review. And so, look, if this works for you, great, but it doesn't have to be the only way. Just to give you a quick summary, the big picture is the most important levels in the overall market and what the street is most concerned about with the overall market. For instance, people are concerned about interest rates rising. For instance, people are concerned about the budget deal that's forthcoming. People are interested in with the US markets, whether or not we're going to see inflation. People are interested in whether or not the Fed is going to continue to print money. That's an example of the big pictures. Intraday fundamentals 
fresh news, new news, something that's unexpected by the marketplace. We want to trade stocks that are in play. Those are stocks that are gapping up 3% or more on increased volume. Those are, those are stocks with fresh news that's unexpected by the marketplace. Technical analysis, we want to look at long-term levels and intraday levels. Our intuition is something for experienced traders, not new traders. Trade management is, if you traded this a thousand times, how would you handle the trade? All right, so make trades your own. So I did a, uh, I did a presentation with Jim Rogers in Singapore a couple of years ago. And um, during a Q&A, Jim was asked repeatedly, for the next hot stock tip. And Jim, as you can see right there, is this incredibly charming southern gentleman. And he sidestepped each question politely. And finally, around the 10th time, he stopped and he answered the question. And he said, you know, you guys are all, you guys are all saying, you guys are all asking me for a hot stock tip. And you know, one of the things that I've learned in the marketplace is that you got to make trades your own. If I give you a hot stock tip, it's not going to matter because I have a different amount of capital than you. I have a different holding period than you. I have a diff different risk tolerance, tolerance than you do. I'm going to take it off and put it on differently than you will. So me actually giving you that hot stock tip is not going to help you. And this process of doing a playbook trade, that's you internalizing setups that make the most sense to you. That's you making trades your own. And yes, Phil, he also does tell everyone to become a farmer. He tells everyone to go buy land in middle America. If you want to actually become rich, he suggests that you go buy a nice plot of farmland somewhere in the Midwest and start learning how to, how to grow things, and that will be the thing that makes you rich in the next 30 years. You want to build from your strengths. You want to understand what you do well. This is the purpose of doing the playbook. You want to understand what you do well. You want to be internalizing these setups. This process of ferreting through all this market data come up with setups that make the most sense to you gives you more confidence when you see those again in real time. Lots of people sit there and they can't pull the trigger on really good setups in real time and they wonder why. It's because you haven't made the connection with your trading brain to be able to do that automatically. When I'm looking at the markets, I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm just chunking the data. I'm just reacting to data that's, that's in my brain that I know what to do with. I'm just searching for patterns that make the most sense for me. Like for instance, I love to trade stocks on the short side that look a certain way on the tape, that gap down, and that show very little strength right on the open. And I like to hold those for the entire day. I know what that trade looks like. And today, you know, one of the reasons why I was taking a look at that HOLX was because it started to look like that type of a trade. But then I noticed, based on my intuition, that it didn't because of the way it was spreading out. Uh, and, and, I, and I adapted to my previous position. And you know, when I was taking a look at, at SRPT and RACs, that was, in my trading brain, worth downside risk because I've taken the time to, to organize these setups in a way that you can trade. That rack setup is a below VWAP short opportunity for me. That's the trade. That's what I see. That SRPT, that SRPT is, is a massive gap down opportunity with horrible trading news. I've traded that pattern hundreds of times in my trading career. But I'm just looking at it as a, as a pattern. I'm not saying I think RACs is going to go down. I don't think RACs, I'm not looking at it that way. I don't care if the stock's going to go up or down. I see a pattern. I see a pattern that I've seen before that's worthwhile for me to take on risk, and I put on that risk because that's my job. 
it's not about I think Rax is going to go down. It's not like I'm going on the financial media entertainment complex and spouting in an uber confident way that Rax has to go down because that's for fake traders. That's not what I do as a professional trader. That's make believe. That's Trader Disneyland, what those people do on the financial media entertainment complex. None of us actually do that as pro traders. None of us sit there with uber confidence in any of our trades. And none of us could care less if we're right or not. That's not my job. I, I don't care if I'm right. I care if I see risk worth taking and I don't take it. That's what I care about. I care if I cut a position too early that I shouldn't have that's not part of my reasons to cover system. It's not about being right in racks. It's about, it's about identifying a pattern that I've seen before that I've, I've predetermined is worth risk and I take the risk. Okay, as opposed to the, the Trader Disneyland, which is, I'm supposed to predict where Rax is going to go. I'm supposed to predict where Facebook's going to go. I'm supposed to predict where Tesla's going to go. Let me tell you something. I've written two books, and we back all these traders in this firm, and I have no idea where any of those stocks are going. I shouldn't say I have no idea, but, I, but I'm not uber confident about where they're going to go. And I think that what happens to traders like yourself who are coming here to get better is you're brainwashed into thinking that you're supposed to know. Well, I can tell you as a professional trader, I don't know. I know where there's opportunity for me to put on risk, and I know how to manage my risk. But I really didn't know what Rax was going to do today, and I really didn't know what SRPT was going to do today. And I kind of really thought Hulk was going to go down for the rest of the day, and I wasn't right about that. And I thought DDD was going to go up from $50, but I didn't know it was going to go to 77 And I kind of think Twitter's going to trade down into the mid-30s, but I'm not so sure. So anyway, doing this helps you to build confidence when you see opportunities worth risk. Being a bionic discretionary trader. So what does that mean? So being bionic is very important for today's trader. And what being bionic means is it means you can't miss. You can't miss your A plus setup. So after you've gone through the work of creating that playbook, you're going to come up with A plus setups and you've got to be creating customer filters for your A plus setups. Okay, if you're a retail trader, go call up Trade Ideas if you can't code or go to TradeStation. If you're not trading with custom filters, if one of my guys on my desk doesn't have custom filters for his A plus setups, we put him on the demo. We bring him in our office, we close the door, and I ask him, exactly when do you want to become a professional trader? Exactly when are you going to start to do the things that are important to you making money? That's not acceptable. And it's not acceptable for you either. You know, what they should be talking about in the cable entertainment, financial media entertainment complex is they should have people come on and say, how do you build your custom filters? Now, that wouldn't be very good television. But that's how you make money. We're all different. We're all different. I don't know how you might trade setups way better than I do that aren't interesting to me. And my guys on the desk, some of my guys are still micro scalping. You know, Pippin, who I wrote about in the playbook, is a great scalper. I don't know how he does it. He just processes information better than other people. And he scalps the you know what out of the marketplace. I think like last month, he's still a developing trader. He's I don't even think he's traded for three years. You know, I think last month he made over forty thousand dollars, and you know he's just he's just scalping in and out of the marketplace. He's never going to lose money ever. His downside, making over forty thousand dollars in a month. You know what his downside is? Positive ten thousand dollars. That's his downside. But you can't you got You can't miss your A plus setups. All right. So we have you know on our desk we use tools like the SME scanner. This is a copy of the SME scanner. This is a tool that helps us find certain setups that are trending the ways that we like, that are doing certain things that we predetermined. 
are worth our attention. You gotta be bionic. Quant speak to be bionic. So here is here is a here is a uh, here's something from my email box that I sent to one of our quants about a particular filter that I wanted him to build. I mean, this is the type of stuff we're doing. This is this is what I write to our quants. Because I'm looking for I'm looking for setups that I love that I want to take risk on and I gotta make sure I've got filters that are finding these setups. The power of professional trading tools. So we're supplementing all of our preparation on the open with these powerful tools. We've got preparation tools which are making our prep time shorter and shorter. I used to have to spend two hours a day preparing. Now I spend 30 minutes. We've got these scanning filters that are looking for my best trades. We've got idea generation tools where I'm tapped into the best ideas of the guys on our desk. And you can, on our desk, you can see what our senior traders are trading live. So we built the SME scanner. This is, these are powerful algorithms that search the pre-market for the stocks that we want to trade and instead of looking through all of the instead of looking through all of the news feeds that I used to look through I come in I sit down on my desk and I hit a button and all the stocks I want to trade populate and then from there I start to look for stocks that are up or down three percent stocks with a lot of volume on the pre-market and I go to work but it saves me about an hour and a half each day just by having this tool we have SMB real time where you can see the positions of the guys on our desk. If you want to know what position Steve's trading, you can just see it. If I'm in something and I kind of want to know what Steve is doing, I'm able to just pull up SMB real time and see that in our chat. Our guys are, are, are saying, watch this, watch that. You know, here's an idea by Lulu. We're tapped, we're supplementing all of our pre-game routine with these tools. We have the SME radar, even after all the time we prepared, we're still supplementing our idea generation. This is an incredibly powerful tool. I think this is a tool that probably should be on the desktop of all professional traders. This is day after day consistently finding the best stocks to trade. We have a midday and after hours review which we, uh, we deliver. Sometimes you guys can go on the blog and, and see us do a midday review. Sometimes we throw it up on the blog. We just talk about what I'm trading, why I traded it, what our guys are trading, why. Uh, you could have you captured that ONVO move if you listened to our midday review yesterday. Um, one of our guys made a nice uh, options play in that, which you talked about yesterday. We have uh, an SMB AM meeting. So, you know, our guys, we have the scanner, you come in, you, you start to get prepared, and then Steve, Steve Spencer, who is my trading partner, uh, one of the co-founders of, of SMB, he does the SMB AM meeting every day. Uh, this is a shot of him on Bloomberg talking about high-frequency trading. And, you know, I, I'm not shy to say this. Steve is, hands down, the best consistently offering active trader commentary on U.S. equities in the entire world. I'm going to say that again. Steve is the very best active trader consistently offering feedback on U.S. equities in the world. And, and I say this jokingly, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of serious, which is if you disagree with me, come over here and I'll fight you outside. You should, follow, you should be following him. Business Insider did a spot on a bunch of people to be following in the financial markets on Twitter and stock twits. And Steve was one of the people recognized as a must follow. Steve went to Wharton. He loves to, he loves to trade the markets. When I want to talk about something that's going on at our firm, it's almost like I have to tear him off of his trading desk. He's tapped into almost everything that's going on. And during our SMB AM meeting, you get to listen to him prepare our desk for a trading session. 
And I think if, if we go back and we look at the top three ideas, which he's talking about, those are the, those are the stocks that are almost always most in play. And so, multi-product. So I think that one of the things that we've got to be thinking about because of technology is not to just become good at one product and then bigger. We want to become, you want to become consistently profitable in one product and you do want to trade bigger, but then you want to learn how to express your favorite patterns in other products. So let me give you an example. So uh, Pippin from the playbook, remember he's that really terrific scalp trader? Well, he's starting to learn how to express short intraday moves with weekly options in a way that's more efficient than him actually just trading stock. And so instead of just having a revenue line for intraday equities, he's got a revenue line now for weekly options. He's learning to express his favorite patterns better with options. And on our desk, our guys trade multiple accounts. They have an intraday account, they have a swing equity account, and they have an options account. And so not only are they expressing their thoughts in the marketplace as an intraday trader, but they're trading longer time frames and they're doing it with other products as well. So being multi-market, I, uh, I had the privilege of being invited to go work with the largest prop firm in South Africa. They do 10% of their market. My task was to teach them U.S. equities and certainly help them to trade their markets in London. One of the great things about writing a book is you get asked to do really cool things that you never imagined that you would. This firm was a suburban oasis. The traders traded in a mansion. I walked in. There were two maids preparing braai, which is barbecue. They had a fully stocked bar a little bit further into the right, and I mean fully stocked. Everything imaginable to be consumed was there. They had a lounging area with flat screen TVs everywhere. Unfortunately, they were broadcasting cricket, which is a sport I've never gotten yet. There was a pool to the left, a gym and a shower to the back. Of course, what trading floor doesn't actually have a gym and a shower? And the second floor of the mansion was a trading desk. And so, you know, I go there and these guys don't necessarily know who I am. They hear this guy's coming in from New York and, and uh, that was the phone ringing. I, I hope that wasn't my wife. <laughs> I hope that wasn't her. So, the first rule of coaching, so I go in there, these guys don't know who I am, and, and I think that some people are, have uh, reservations about trading coaches and guys who write books. And so, and these guys don't know me. And the first rule of coaching is you have to show people you care. And so I spent a lot of time just getting to know these guys. And what I found was they had a very interesting core firm philosophy they took elite tennis players and tried to turn them into pro traders. I talked to one trader and he was, when he was 16, he beat Pete Sampras. And I talked to another trader and he was 70th in the world. And I talked to another trader and he had won four doubles Wimbledon, he had won four major doubles championships. And I talked to another trader and he had won the silver medal with Tim Henman in the Olympics. And these were former athletes who were now trading. The firm founder, who was one of the best junior South African tennis players when he was younger, believed that if he hired these former athletes, they would fight better every tick. So, 
one of the things that one of the things that we certainly learn, one of the things I learned from going there is that and one of the things that was very refreshing to me was there are elite traders who are reaching out for coaching. And I think that oftentimes people think that elite traders sort of figure everything out for themselves and they don't and I can just tell you we employ at our firm, we employ at our firm, even after guys have gone through um, our education and even even while we've coached them up to being consistently profitable, we uh, we have lots of we have lots of coaches that we employ to work with our traders. You know, one of one of our guys who just made the biggest leap to over fifty thousand dollars a month was somebody probably in the summer who was was needed a timeout. You know, with somebody really struggling. And I think that what these guys recognized was that they needed great coaching to, you know, get them making more money, and they were, they were receptive to that. And I can tell you that as we work and employ these coaches, they certainly work with a lot of the best traders in the world as well. And, you know, coaching is something that, is always going to be important to you getting to where you want to go. And there's a great book written by Matthew Syed called Bounce, which researches really high-level performers and concludes that very few people have become great at anything without great coaching. And so when I was there, we had a little bit of a we had a little bit of a tussle about the way they were trading the markets because all they were doing was fading everything. And as you perhaps know about me, I like to trade with the trend. And look, it's not my job to get these guys to trade the way I do, but it certainly is my job to point out if they're making trades that are against fundamental market principles. And trading is trading. Fading really, really strong markets doesn't work. And shorting really, really weak markets, uh, I mean, and, and shorting really, really strong markets doesn't work getting along really, really weak markets doesn't work uh, as well either. And so I'm sitting there, first day I'm there, they made what I say is the made-up fade trade in first round. It's one of their banks, there's three really big banks in South Africa, first round is one of them. The stock breaks out on fresh news and volume. And they start shorting, and I can see they're shorting. And they're short the first pop, that's fine. You know, shorting the first pop above a major technical level is, is okay. But then after time and volume, they're still doing the same thing. The stock goes above the level, holds above the level, goes up higher, and they're still shorting. That is fundamentally a poor trade. After time and volume commence, and you're still shorting above the important technical level, now you're making a fundamentally poor trade. And we talked about that. And by the end, by the end of my visit, we started to work with them towards seeing trend trend trade opportunities like in NPN where it busts above a 52 week high and instead of them fading and fading and fading and ripping up 15 grand they're making 50 four banks thanks Lawrence and and these guys you know were holding this until there was a reason to sell So scalable risk management, and I think this is something that all of us need to really think about. I think discretionary traders are wasting energy complaining about their risk rules at a lot of firms because, because they, there's a lot of discretionaries wasting energy and complaining about their risk rules because they don't have, they don't have systems that are, they don't have firms, they don't have trades that are scalable. And, you know, Dr. Steenbarger, who now works for Paul Tudor Jones, was, a, was one, of the, one of the people that worked with one of our traders. He worked at a lot of other big hedge funds as well while he was working with some of our guys. Um, and Dr. Steenbarger now works with uh, Paul Tudor Jones' firm and, and is responsible for hiring all the coaches there. And, you know, I can tell you 
from the anecdotes that I get from the world's really big traders that they don't think in terms of P&L, they think in terms of percentages. When they're making a trade, they're going to risk a certain percentage of their book. So they don't think about buying 5,000 shares, they think about the risk that they're willing to take on a particular trade in percentage terms for an idea. Percentages are scalable because if you can think in percentages on a million dollar book and you're profitable doing that, well then we just, we just bump your book up. We just make your book bigger. And so that becomes, that puts you in a situation to be very, very dangerous. All right, so you want to develop clear rules. You want to make sure there's trader buy-in and, and you want to make sure, and if there isn't trader buy-in, you, you got to get rid of him. So I thought that, I'm sorry guys, I thought that Big Mike was, was going to jump in here and be fielding some of these questions. I actually didn't look at these questions until now. I just assumed everyone was being quiet, but maybe we miscommunicated. So let me, let me hit some of these questions and try and do that. Hey Mike, I was staying quiet because you were on such a roll. <laughs> oh, my bad. Now there, there's been a few questions. Uh, I'll try to pick some that uh, seem popular that I've seen uh, in the past many, many times. So what about people that say that um, the only way to really prove that you're a good trader is to show everybody your, your bank statements? My bank statements or my... Oh, your, your trade statements, sorry. Brokerage statements. So, yeah, so look, I, I understand that lots of people ask that. I mean, um, I, my sense from my sense from that question is um, that's probably a question that you you just don't respond to, um, and you don't respond to that uh, because it doesn't you know, matter. <laughs> It's just, it's just you still don't respond to that. I mean, I think we would respectfully. But I think that we would. Just, I think we I mean, would respectfully I, say that's. I'm not going to give you info. No, I, I, to, I totally understand. But I, what I see is people that ask that question that don't really. They maybe they don't know why it's not a really good question to ask. I mean, you know, I've I've had the conversation before where, I mean, there there's so many. It doesn't even matter. Even if I were to show you a statement, it still doesn't matter. You know. I mean, it's yeah. not going to matter as to whether or not you're going to be any good. And really, honestly, it doesn't even matter as to whether or not I'm any good because I could have another statement that I didn't show you, right? <laughs> I mean, who knows? So, it's endless. So I, yeah, so, you know, I, I, um, we get asked this question a lot. And I, I have to say that, you know, my response to that would be we have an office in Midtown, New York, and our business model is we back – you know, all the traders. Um, the office space here is incredibly expensive. We have lots of, lots of staff here. Um, if you were applying, if you were an experienced trader applying to this firm and you wanted to say, hey, you know, do you want to sit around, do you want to sit around a bunch of guys who make a lot of money, how much, how much are guys making? I think we would quietly uh, let you talk to our traders um, and you could, you can talk to them about how much money they're making. Um, and so, you know, I, I yeah, think me, that, and, and then, but, and that's, so that would be the first part of that. Um, and then I think the second way I would answer it, and I think this is kind of important, one of the articles I wrote about a long time ago for SFO Magazine was, uh, you know, find the best teacher. And I, this actually didn't get a lot of traction. I thought it was an important point to make at the time, um, mainly because, I don't understand, Mike, I don't understand why, and look, I, I'll just say, I mean, I've traded my own account for many, many years, and I do trade every day, um, and I have not moved into the, I have not moved into the category of guy who uh, just manages and, and, and guy who spends lots of time um, hawking trading programs. I'm, I'm a professional trader, and that's what I do every day, and you can see that, um, you can see that on SMB real time. But even if I weren't, you know, let's let's take a look at the really good coaches in the world. And I wrote about this in this article. Let's take a look at the really good coaches in the world. I mean, I, I think it kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense for 
people to think that really good teachers necessarily have to be the best players because that's not true in, in other disciplines for coaching. And I think that I think there's also too high of, a, of an expectation for people who go through trader training as to where they're going to be. Like for instance, if you go down to your local golf pro, you don't expect your local golf pro to, to A, play on the PGA Tour. You expect them to be a competent golfer. And B, you don't expect yourself to play on the PGA Tour after you, you take two months of lessons from your local golf pro. But it seems like for some reason in, in the world of trader education that some people have the expectation that they have to be guaranteed this, uh, this right to, yeah. to make money yeah. when really what, they should, what, what their goal should be is to get better. I mean, if you take training, you should get better. Someone should help you improve. That, that should be, really be the standard. And I think you're, you're setting yourself up to be lied to um, if, you, if you expect that all of the good trader educators have to be seven-figure traders. Let's, let me change gears for just one second and ask something else that I wanted to ask earlier that I think applies to a lot of people that are in the webinar. So what if, if someone is trading one instrument in and out every day, let's say their future is trading an instrument like oil or something, okay? What, it, without knowing any other information, do you think that's a good or a bad idea? So I think that's great. I, I think that's a huge accomplishment. I, I don't think there's enough made of people actually getting to the point where they're profitable. There's, there's different steps along a trading career. And the first step is to lose money. And the next step, which is an accomplishment, is to lose less money. Right. <laughs> and the next step after that, which is a, which is a huge accomplishment, Breaking. is to be flat for the month. <laughs> right. And then the next step after that is, is to find a pattern or patterns where you're, where you're moderately profitable. And then the next step after that is to, get, to expand your playbook. And the next step after that is get big in those, in those best setups. And so, you know, Mike, what I would say to you is that's really wonderful progress. If you're making money in, in one type of trade or one type of product. But I would suggest based on the ability for you to get education on other products and based on the access that you have to be able to trade, which is unique, other products, these electronic platforms are getting better and better every day and it is new and we are only in the first couple of innings of electronic trading that if you can if you can learn to express that futures trade in equities or in options that you should consider doing that too because then you will start to make more money and there definitely are ways to take that pattern in that futures product and express it as an equity trade and as an options trade where you're increasing your P&L. Right. Let me take a couple more questions I see on the screen. Mike is asking, does SMB back any remote traders or do they need to be physically present in your office? So we do back remote traders. Uh, let's see. There's, yep. Okay, go ahead. No, there's an app. I mean, look, I'm not going to tell you it's easy to get uh, to, to, to be backed by or, or to be backed by the firm. It's, it's not. I mean, we, there's, uh, there's a process you go through. And uh, we ask you questions, and you and we talk to you, and we make sure you're a good cultural fit, and we make sure um, we take a look at your runs, um, right. and so we go from there. But if you're a profitable remote trader, we're interested. Walt is asking something interesting. So, go, he's basically asking, why do you need more than one play? Why not, why not just scale up the one trade? And that's kind of what I was really expecting you to answer. Well, my question is the diversification yeah. part of it. So, yeah, well, futures, so Mike, that's, and that's a good question. I, I, I apologize for, for missing the mark on that one. So futures trading is different than equity trading. And futures trading is certainly uh, potentially uh, more scalable than, or you can get bigger with, ec, with futures trading than perhaps equity trading. It, there's, there's the ability to size up with more contracts. And in equity trading, there's perhaps more slippage. 
Um, so futures trading is going to be different than equity trading. Futures trading is probably also not going to offer as many opportunities uh, as equity trading does. Right. Um, so I, I would just suggest they're, they're different, but we have algorithmic strategies that we're running at the firm that are incredibly scalable to the point where we can get much bigger in them than we can in some of our um, equity strategies. You you had mentioned earlier uh, a guy like Pippin who's a good scalper, but can you talk just in general about your guys? I mean, do you, do you find that most of them are day traders and flat overnight? Are most of them swing traders? What, what do you find works in general? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mike. What works for them is what works for them. So our guys who come in, they're taught how to trade. They're taught how to think like a professional trader. Um, I hope the most important thing that people take away from the playbook is how to think like a pro does. And um, so we, you know, they go through a good six months of training. You certainly can trade live after five weeks, but then they go through trader development, and we're still working with them pretty closely. Everybody has a mentor, so there's lots of training that goes on. And uh, but we we tell our guys that one, we're going to expose them to lots of different types of patterns. So Michael, we do during our midday recap and um, our after hours recap is we're talking about a whole series of different ways to attack the markets. I'm pointing out lots of different patterns for people to be able to trade. But then each individual trader from all of those patterns that I've talked about and laid out and, and shown them that are good risk rewards, each individual has to build their own playbook. And they have to have it make sense to them. So, um, you know, Shark is is one of our better traders in the desk, and he likes to trade uh, stocks that are trade are hovering above VWAP, holding above VWAP, or holding below VWAP, and uh, and 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 look for setups like that. And for instance, uh, today we uh, and, and he trades very differently than I do, even though I trained him. Today I was asking, I saw that uh, WLT had pulled back in a lot from that 19 area. And 1630-ish is about the level it really broke out from um, on our longer term charts. And it was pulling into, it was starting to pull into that area it broke out from. And I said, Shark, are you thinking about, if, if WLT goes down a little bit more, are you thinking about buying? And he said, Mike, I don't like to buy support plays. Whereas I really like to buy support plays. If Facebook pulls into 45, I really like that setup. Whereas Shark won't like that setup. And in fact, Pippin will be scalping that thing on the downside all the way into 45 and then flipping it and scalping it from the upside the entire time. Um, and, and, you know, some of our other traders will be, will, be, will be expressing the trade from 45 with options on a longer term basis, perhaps out till the end of the year to see if it will go back to the high of the, of, of the year, of the 52-week high. So we, we show everyone, we, we, we lay out different ways to attack the markets and then each trader has to find their own path. Okay, uh, I don't know if you have more slides because we're getting into this general Q and A, or if you want to go ahead and keep doing the Q and A. Let's do the Q and A. Okay. Uh, Phil's asking how uh, he can tune in to the meetings that you've mentioned here today. So you know, uh, Phil, we we put them we put those midday meetings up on the blog every once in a while, um, so you can you can take a look at them there. I usually rerun them on the blog um, at least three times a week. Um, so just go and register, and, and you should be able to see them. Uh, Krill is asking, when do you start the next DNA successful program? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's it's uh, it got sold out the first one. We did this new program um, where we created this 10 week training program, going over really important topics for people to become uh, consistently profitable and have a really strong foundation for their trading. We put that together. It was a really great training program, and we're actually still in the middle of it right now, Krill. And I'm not sure when we're going to be running it back, but if you go to our site, there's actually a waiting list right now. There's, I think, 189 people on the waiting list right now. Um, so, so go check that out on our blog and get yourself on the waiting list. and, and, and uh, you'll be able to take the program in, in the future. Thanks for asking them. Uh, Mike is asking about what, how, how big of a part of uh, your trading method is reading the tape. 
So it's part of five variables that go into each trading decision. The five variables are the big picture, intraday fundamentals, technical analysis, reading the tape, and intuition. And so I think of a trading decision as a big circle and all five of those variables are inside that circle and the trader should be thinking about each one of those variables before they make each trade. Okay, I'm just I'm scanning for some other questions here. So Jen asks, how do you avoid your company to just generate, Jen asks, how do you avoid uh, your company to just generate commissions instead of net P&L? And so Jen, uh, our firm doesn't upcharge people for commissions. We are, we're a prop firm. We split profits with the traders. It's a 50-50 split. We don't, we charge, you know, whatever our rate is with Goldman, our trader gets that rate. Um, we provide the proprietary technology. We're not interested in making money off commissions. That's not what we do. Uh, if our traders aren't going to make a lot of money, uh, eventually, our traders need to make a lot of money to, to support all of this infrastructure. Um, that's how we want to make money, guys making, you know, real P&L. Right. Uh, Mike, you, I had a question earlier. You threw up a slide that uh, kind of had a few bullet points of an email that you would send to one of your quants, and you were talking about filters and such. So my question to you is, since you're you're talking about discretionary trading, you haven't talked about any algo trading that you're actually doing, unless I wasn't paying attention. So are these filters just basically alarms that go off that you can look at and then place a discretionary trade, or are you trading them algorithmically? So when I say you should be bionic in this day and age, I mean two things. One, you got to make sure that you have custom filters that are finding your A-plus setups for your discretionary trader, for your discretionary trading. And then two, at our firm, uh, we have software where a trader can, from their desktop, back test an idea, front test the idea, turn it on live, and then scale it up, all from the same software. And so, and then if, if they need a little bit of help, there's uh, a series of quants that we have that can help them tweak uh, what they're doing. But the software we have is, is such that you don't need to actually be able to code to be able to uh, back test, forward test, trade live, and then scale up an idea. Um, it's really amazing. And I, I think this is one of the things we're really most excited about. Right now, a majority of our trading is still discretionary, and I wonder if in the future lots of our traders are going to have series of uh, auto strategies that, that they're tweaking on an intraday basis. And so um, the way that it works is you come up with an idea, Mike, and you, you back test it and you see what the results are. If the results are any good, you send them over to the head of uh, automated trading at our firm. He takes a look at it. If he thinks they're okay, uh, then we start to forward test it. Uh, we take a look at the results. As long as the forward test results are, are uh, similar to the back testing, then we'll turn it on live. And that's important. It's, it's not even so much in the forward test whether or not the, the results are positive. It's, it's more about are they consistent with your back testing? Uh, and then we'll turn it live and then if it's good, we'll scale it up. And the quants are taking a look and tweaking that along the way and you're, you're working with, with them to, to make it more efficient. Right. Uh, I see a lot of people asking methodology questions and I, I'm kind of skipping them because I don't really know how you're supposed to answer them when everybody is different. So let, let me know if you want to <laughs> To so Robert, Robert asks, Robert Sweetman asks, uh, what would be the number one thing you'd want to see from someone looking to get a seat trading with SMB? Mindset. There's a great book written by Carol Dweck, which title goes by Mindset. That's the name of the book. And of all the traders that I've seen do really well at our firm and, and on the street, having the mindset to improve every day is the most important thing that you can bring to the table as a trader job is not to make money. You're not going to be a really great trader for three years. You'll make some money along the way, but you got to come in every day thinking about how you get better. And if you think about that, if you come in every day and each trade is just a lesson for you, each losing trade is a lesson for you, each good trade is a lesson for you, we talk on our desk about turning one trading day into 10 by reviewing and by rehearsing. 
And imagine doing that over the course of three years with that mindset to get better every day and that compounding upon each other as opposed to the guy who comes in and is just worried about trading in real time and his results. Juxtapose those traders, trader A and trader B next to each other. I want a guy with a really, really good mindset to improve every day. Uh, Gary's asking if you have a preferred platform. So do all your guys trade the same platform or does it bring your own platform? How does that work? Yeah, so we trade off a proprietary platform. It, it's not available to anyone else but our traders. Okay. And you uh, you touched on walk forward just a second ago in back testing. So uh, I, I don't know how much you can go into detail about this, but whenever you're doing walk forward, can you talk about, or no, I'm sorry, not walk forward, but doing uh, like an incubation or um, uh, out of sample uh, live test. Can you talk about what you're looking for? I mean, you mentioned that it's not just whether or not it's profitable, but you're looking, I guess, for similarities like in the, you know, the risk side similarities and average trade duration perhaps, similarities and maximum uh, adverse excursion versus favorable, favorable excursion. What, what else are you looking at to give us an idea? No, I think you're actually right on it. So when you, you want to do a back test for at least uh, six months and you want to do a forward test for at least two weeks. And so I'm, you're looking at uh, the risk per trade, you're looking at the sharp ratio, you're looking at any divergence between back testing and the forward testing. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the issue um, in forward testing becomes position sizing. So you'll do a back test, and you got to figure out actually how to get the. Uh, you got to be thinking in percentages, um, which a lot of people get wrong. Um, and people don't. Th people think of just I'll just do a hundred shares, a hundred shares, a hundred shares of everything, and then they create a back test when you really should be thinking about money, dollar figures in total for each trade. And so a lot of times we have to smooth that out. Um, but that's a pretty good parameter, six months of back testing, two weeks of forward testing. Okay. Uh, any requirements like the number of trades, you know, how big the sample has to be? I mean, six months, but what if it's only six trades? That's not... Yeah. <laughs> There's certainly... It. So yeah, that goes to head of automated trading and okay. uh, he's got a green light He's got a green light to strategy after you back test it. Okay. Um, Joe says, how did you get out of a slump? So I wrote about this in one good trade, Joe. The way to get out of a trading slump is to think about the trades that you really feel most comfortable with. So, so, so in your mind, before you actually uh, trade for the day, Think about your favorite trades and set your mind to only make those favorite trades. Just trade those favorite trades. And then take your tier size and reduce it. Get yourself smaller. And then just for the next two days, just try and be positive. Just, just, just do whatever you can to have a positive P&L. When you're positive, if you give back 25% of your your, your gains, go home for the day. And then what tends to happen, essentially what you're trying to do is make the game easier. You know, if you're playing basketball and you're not hot, one of the things they tell you to do is take a layup or try and get to the free throw line to get yourself back into the rhythm. And that's what you want to do as a trader, make the game easier. So your best setups, trade them with less size, and make sure you keep your profits. After a couple of days, you'll forget that you're in a slump. Right. Uh, earlier you talked about archiving a good setup, but I don't think you talked just in general about journaling. So any comments on the importance of journaling or what, what a trader should be journaling and writing down? Yeah, so there's, there's two things that our guys do before they leave. They create a detailed trading journal. They create a detailed trade review. And secondly, they, they archive a playbook trade that made the most sense to them. Now, all of this uh, is housed inside of something we call SMBU Performance Center. And in the past, we used to have internal tools. And we, we, have, we, we have internal tools. They're different than SMB Performance Center. But there's, there's number crunching that goes into the trades of our guys. So, Every day, 
they're, they're, they themselves are creating this detailed trade review, which is like a trading journal, like most people keep a trading journal. And they're, they're archiving a playbook trade that made the most sense to them, and they're number crunching. And so our guys have information like, well, how are they trading stocks over $60? How are they trading between 9.30 and 10.30? Um, you know, what is the difference between the amount of money they're losing on a particular trade and making on a particular trade? And I'll give you a really good example of how this can be helpful. So we had a seven-figure trade uh, trading with our firm, multiple seven-figure trader who was underperforming. And this person had a negative bias on the marketplace, and he's had this negative bias for the last couple of years. And we needed a very nice way to go to him and say, hey, maybe we should stop shorting the market. It doesn't seem to go down. Um, but you never really want to tell a trader how to attack the markets. But having said that, if you can present them data that suggests that what they're doing isn't in their best interests, it's your obligation to present that to them. So we crunched his numbers, and we found that any time he held a short for over two hours, that strategy was unprofitable. And any time he held a short that was trading against him overnight, that strategy wasn't unprofitable. But when that trader was actually holding shorts for 30 minutes or less, he was actually doing very well. And so we presented this data to the trader and said, what do you think? And he said, oh, I've got to get rid of these other types of trades. And so at 3.59, sure enough, when his positions that he was short with were trading against him, he would cut them and take them off the table overnight. But guess what he was doing at 9.31? He just put his <laughs> shorts right back on. Right. So he was thwarting this process that we had worked on together where the data was clearly showing that he was acting against his self-interest, and we had to actually let the trader go. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about daily loss limits or daily profit targets. You know, some people... I mean, I think a lot of people subscribe to the daily loss limit, but there have been some questions about whether or not there should be a target objective at which point you stop trading for the day. So any comments on that? Yeah, so this is controversial. I think that a trader should have a intraday loss limit equal to the median good day for them. So if your median good day is $3,000, I think your intraday stop loss should be $1,500. I think when you're growing as a trader, if you are up oh, $1,000 on the open, you might think about having a 25% give back rule. Uh, this is a way to, to, to give yourself some confidence as you go forward. Um, in terms of the upside, I don't think you should ever have, I think you should create a, I think you should create a goal for uh, how much money you want to make in a particular month. I think that's, that's very effective. But I, don't, I think you should understand that you might do much better. And I'll give you an example. One of our, one of our younger guys uh, was trying to make $25,000 uh, for the month, and there was about seven trading days to go. And he got to $20,000 um, and was like, oh, I think I might be able to do this. And I had a conversation with him and said, Why, what's with this $25,000 number? That's arbitrary. You know, maybe you'll make much more than that. There's still plenty of time left in the month. And instead of stopping at $25,000, I mean, he, he ended up making, I think, about $43,000 for the month. But if he just would have stopped at $25,000, uh, he, he would have never made personal highs. So I don't like the idea of ceilings um, for your personal highs. You can become better than you ever thought you would be. You can make more than you ever thought you would be. Don't get in the way of that. Right. So basically like a trailing stop for your day, right? You said 25% give back? Yes. Okay. Uh, since we're getting kind of late here, I've got one more question, and then maybe we could go to the to the books. Um, awesome. Let's, okay. Uh, could you read, actually, the question is simple. If uh, you could just repeat the name, the author's name of that book. I think it was called Mindset. Sure. It's Carol Dweck is the author, and the book is Mindset. Okay. Okay. Uh, and just real quick, any other books besides your own, of course, and maybe uh, Dr. Brett's, any other books that are on your absolute must-read list? Yeah, I think The Talent Code by Dan Coyle is a must-read for anyone who wants to become a great trader. It teaches you how to become great at anything. Okay. Um, all right, so the, uh, the Q&A for, well, the, for the books. Let's go to those questions. I didn't get a chance. Okay. 
So I didn't get a chance to finish all this, but I also do not want my wife to call up right. and <laughs> give me a hard time. Um, all right, so guys, so skip through. Uh, what I'm going to do for anybody that wins a autographed copy of the book, I'm going to ask for your BMT username so I could get a hold of you after we're done here. Uh, if you don't have one, you can get one real quick. It's free. It takes about 30 seconds. Just go to bigmiketrading.com. So just be ready to give me your username if you're one of the winners, and then I'll contact you as soon as the webinar is done, and we'll get the uh, autograph details and your mailing address and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, Mike, also, I see you got an email address at the bottom, but for anybody that did not get their question answered or if they have a question about anything else, is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. My email address is mbellafury at smbcap.com, which I think is at the very end of this. Okay. I'll, I'll show it. The very last thing I'll do is, is uh, show it. Okay. All right. You guys ready for the quiz? Are you ready, Big Mike? I'm ready. to just, do this? Yeah, just uh, have the questions box open so you can help me get the answers. Okay. And I'm going to start in two seconds. Ready? One, two. <laughs> so I actually showed this before, uh, Mike, and uh, the first person who actually got it was just before the start of this, and that person's name was uh, C.J. Hubbard. Okay. Everybody stop typing, please. That's still four. Yeah, it's going off the screen. All right. So, uh, C.J., can you just give me your BMT username real fast? So just waiting for that to go to the second question. So everybody have your username ready, please. CJ. And uh, yeah, Mary says, can, can we only win once? That's correct. One, one book per, per person. Okay, guys, we're, we'll move on. CJ, just type it in at the very end, okay? All right, so go ahead and go to question two. Greg Reniker wins. Greg Reniker. So Greg actually um, is the creator of an incredible, an incredible review tool called TraderView, which uh, if you guys aren't using as professional traders. As we say, if you are not crunching your numbers and reviewing your work, it's very difficult for us to take you seriously. TraderView is a really wonderful tool for a yeah, retail no, trader. We highly recommend you checking it out. Yeah, we've, uh, he's on a webinar for us on, uh, BM, on BMT. All right, so Greg, just remind me what your username is so I don't have to go look. Okay. All right, so question three. <laughs> Name three of five variables that SME uses to make a trading decision. you got to have three, so uh, Nick won. Nick Stoic. No, All right. Nick Stroik. All right, Nick, can you need your username, please? Waiting for Nick. All right, so you guys have that ready. All right, so number four. Who cares about your opinion in the marketplace? Judy Anderson wins. <laughs> All right, Judy, I need your username, please. I just realized we're not reading the answers back for the recording, so the answer on that one is no one. All right, Judy, I need that, so you're going to need to give it to me. All right, and uh, so question number five. What are the four ingredients necessary to become great at anything? <laughs> Sorry, look. 
So looking for four answers on one line. All right, I'm going to give it to uh, Earl Kramer. We actually didn't get a chance to go over this. Um, it was at the end of it. The four, the four ingredients necessary to become great at anything are domain knowledge, the ability to sustain your energy or passion, critical feedback or great mm -hmm. coaching, and purposeful practice. Right, Earl, I need your username, please. They are domain knowledge, the ability to sustain your energy, critical feedback, and purposeful practice are the four things that go into becoming great at anything. You cannot become a great trader without, without those four things. Okay, CJ, I got it. All right, so let's go to number book number six. All right. Oh, it's going fast. Lawrence R. Uh, okay. So Lawrence, I need your Lawrence username. R. Well, I don't. I don't see him on the screen. What? Uh, what was the answer? Uh, Jim Rogers. Okay. All right. I'm trying to keep track. I think I'm still waiting on. Anderson's username. All right, uh, book number seven. Again, we didn't get to this, but uh, there it is. Uh, Jeff Holden. Jeff Holden is the winner. Okay. That's impressive. We actually didn't get to that one either, but that is right. Phil Mickelson. Phil Mickelson has a coach who helps him with his long swing, his short game, his putting, his fitness, his mindset. He has a caddy who helps him on each one of his shots. All right, Jeff, I got it. Okay, good. Uh, let's go to <laughs> number, <laughs> number eight. Does he play cricket? What two books did I write? Uh, oh, it's going fast. Suprenda. Oh, we went too fast. All right, guys, stop. Suprenda, stop somebody. Suprenda. Yeah. There was somebody, Suprenda. Yeah, I got it. Um, okay, I need your yeah, BNT username. Suprenda Puji. So the answer is one good trade and the playbook. Correct. And I need the, uh, the username, please. Okay, got it. All right, so I, I hear both of these. I hear both of these books are pretty good. <laughs> that's, just, that's just what I hear. All right, book number nine. Who consistently provides the best active trader commentary? Oh, I'm not looking. Um, we got Kenny Rowe. I'm looking. So many people I've got to find it on the list here. Kenny Rowe. And the answer is Steve Spencer. Okay, Kenny, I need your username. And so the, this is uh, your best friend, right? Yes. Uh, okay, so I remember you said at the beginning of the webinar that you, you know, asked him to help you start the firm. I guess that means he said yes, right? <laughs> yeah, he, I think I just basically started and the wheels were in motion, as they say, to the point where at some point he couldn't say no. <laughs> All right, book Rich, number you gotta two. You got to get fast on the keyboards. This is, this is, a, this is a speed game. There's no, there's, no <laughs> crying in, there's no crying in these answers. Just, just type faster or just guess what the next answer is going to be before I even ask it. All right, last book. Also, would it kill you to actually go buy the book? If you don't win, would it kill you to actually go to Amazon and spend the 30 bucks? All right, last one. What's the most important lesson the market will teach you? 
Marshall, Marshall T. Marshall T. All right. Marcel T. Yeah, Marcel needs your username, please. You can be better tomorrow than you are today. Okay, and I, th I think I think there's one person I did not get their username. It was book number four, uh, Anderson, I think, Anderson something. All right, so congratulations, guys, on winning the books. I'll get in touch with you just a few minutes from now and uh, get your autograph request and everything, and we'll send it over to Mike at SMB. So, uh, Mike, I want to thank you for your time and putting together the PowerPoint and for coming on and talking to us, especially considering how much trouble you're going to get in once you get home. <laughs> yeah. I have to change my uh, my bio pretty soon. Nah. All right, so uh, if anybody has questions I did not get to answer today, uh, info at smbcap.com, or you can go to the website smbu.com. Uh, Mike, I really appreciate it, and I'll post the recording for this on, uh, on the site and on YouTube sometime tomorrow, and I'll send you an email with it, Mike, if you want to uh, link it to you guys. All right, thanks a lot, Mike. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I love the questions at the end. No one has ever been creative enough to actually suggest that. That's a great idea. It's actually one of the, I think probably the best part of the webinars that we do is always the questions, at least for me. I like the questions. So I hope to have you back and we'll do it again. Okay. Thanks, right. Mike. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Right. Great night.